Okay, uh, welcome to the PI Education uh, webinar, um, Investigator Strategies and Tactics for Surveillance. I'm Hal Humphreys, I'll be your host today. I'm the Director of Education at PI Education. I'm also the editor of Pursuit Magazine. I wanted to give a quick shout out to TransUnion TLO XP. Um, it's the database that I use. Uh, it's a good resource for investigators. Um, if you don't use TransUnion TLO XP, I would strongly suggest that you check them out. Uh, they're a great resource. And just for your information, they are not paying for this advertisement. I just feel strongly that they're a really good resource. Hi, I'm Hal. Uh, today we're going to be talking about surveillance strategies. And I have joining me Michael Sands of Guardian Detective Agency. And Michael is a surveillance operative here in Nashville, Tennessee, where we're uh, headquartered. <clears throat> Michael is one of my good friends. Uh, I have worked with Michael on a professional basis. Uh, I have found him to be one of the most ethical, one of the best surveillance operatives around. And I wanted to bring him on today to help us talk about surveillance. A couple things to think about today as we're going through this. In the bottom right-hand side of your screen, uh, you'll see a chat function. If you have any questions uh, while we're here today, do not hesitate to post those questions. Uh, if you do, uh, I will be able to see them and um, we'll try to get to the answers as we can. Uh, so please feel free to join in, chime in, ask questions, send comments, whatever you want to do. Um, we would be thrilled to try and get to those uh, questions. As we go. <clears throat> One more thing I wanna make sure that we're all clear on. Um, we are not offering legal advice. We are not telling you what's legal, what's not. We're not attorneys, we're investigators. I think most of the people in the class today are investigators, not attorneys. Um, <coughs> our suggestions are just that, they're suggestions. Um, the opinions expressed are solely my opinions and Michael's opinions. They are not necessarily the opinion of Pursuit Magazine or PI Education. Uh, we just need to get that disclaimer out there um, first and foremost. If you ask a question, uh, we may respond to the question and use your name uh, and say, you know, <laughs> Bill from Syracuse has asked about X, Y, or Z, and we'll try and answer that question. Um, so those are kind of the ground rules. Now I'd like to take a second to introduce Michael Sands. Michael, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, how can you hear me? I can now. You got visual? I do. Great. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the class. Uh, my name is Michael Sands. Of course, I'm a private investigator. Uh, I've been in business 18 years for myself. Part of that, I have a law enforcement background. I was a police captain and was a U.S. Army Reserve Officer and helicopter pilot. Tell us a little bit more about yourself, Michael. What kind of work do you primarily do? Over the last 18 years, we've kind of been known nationwide as the surveillance experts. That's what we do. We're out following people, videotaping them almost daily. Tell me, by and large, what are your clients? Who are your clients? Do you work for insurance companies? Do you work for individuals? Do you work for attorneys? A little bit of everybody, but probably about 70% of my business is family law. Divorce, child custody, the remainder is workers' comp fraud, things of that nature, some criminal work. But again, mostly all surveillance. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's go ahead and get into the topic of surveillance. Exactly what is surveillance? How do you define surveillance, Michael? Surveillance is just going out, visually documenting what's going on, what's not going on, and just whatever your case is. You know, it's pretty simple. Just going out and documenting visually or by video. Right. Um, so I think what we'd end up saying is uh, surveillance is the observation of people during their day-to-day -day activities and just trying to document what they're doing, what they may not be doing. Um, for an insurance fraud case, I'm going to guess you would have assignments where somebody has 
claim that they're injured and you need to document that they in fact are doing things that they say they can't do stuff like that. Is that correct? Absolutely. On the insurance fraud, uh, for most of you who are working or will be working it, uh, you're documenting, um, people violating the restrictions, what they're supposed to be. If they have a shoulder back injury, they can't lift or squat or push or pull a certain amount of weight. And you're out videotaping and documenting those activities and of those of them violating those restrictions. Great. Um, and the first question popped up, uh, the question of, will this webinar cover counter surveillance topics as well? Uh, that's for Brian. And I would say, yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit. We'll talk about counter surveillance uh, techniques a little bit oh, uh, and, and how to tell if your subject may in fact be on to you. Um, we got a question uh, prior to the webinar today via email and the uh, person writing the email was saying, hey, <clears throat> I do a lot of rural surveillance and a lot of times these people know that they're being watched. So that's something we're going to get into a little bit later on. But yeah, we'll cover that topic, Brian. Um, Michael, do you ever deal with people that, that know they're being followed? We've had a couple of maybe I thought may have been suspicious. Um, but they're again, depend on what you know about that person. If there's been prior surveillance, that's something. If you get a case, ask if there's been any work done prior so you know what you're getting into. Uh, so, you know, if you don't want to set, you know, four or five houses down, they're aware of their surroundings and no any new vehicles in the area. On those cases, you'll need to set on the most likely route of departure. So we'll talk about also some pre-surveillance stuff. So if you go by the neighborhood and see where it's laid out or look at a Google map of where everything's at, um, where, which direction would they normally travel to go to a store or work or something like that? And then you kind of set along those routes to get them leaving the house. Right, exactly. So let's just jump right into preparing for surveillance. Um, what is one of the first things you do when you get a surveillance job? You get a call from a client saying, hey, I've got this child custody thing. Um, we need to have surveillance done on the husband. What do you ask the lawyer for? What, what, what things are you looking for from the lawyer? I want any and all information possible. The more information, the better. It helps just make our case and get the, most, um, the best results in the least amount of time. Uh, that's my biggest thing when I work. We stay pretty busy, so I try to get the cases turned around as quick as possible with you know the results we they want. Um, always asking, of course, names, ages. We want pictures, pictures of our subject or any possible um, person that we be having an affair with, any places they may frequent, bars or any activities they do. On um, and we always look at social media. I mean it. If we have like a workers' comp case, I'm always going to look at social media, Facebook or something to see what activities they're doing. If they're in like a softball league or if their kids are in something, so we'll know they'll go to a ballpark. So it's kind of, you know, all information possible and to know their schedules if they have a certain habits or patterns. So you can kind of have an idea what's going on with that. Okay. So what we're looking for from the, from the client uh, is... Um, photographs of the subject, if possible, um, personal identifiers, anything you can use to identify the subject of your surveillance. Um, that would include date of birth, social security number. One of the most useful things I find is having the license plate number for their car. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's a great also, way. To, hang on one second. Go ahead. Also, yeah, vehicle descriptions or if they can physically give you a picture of the vehicle, Perfect, because it never fails. I mean, you're on surveillance, looking for one car, and you see 20 of them. I mean, seriously, it always happens. Then also, if there's any identifying stickers, bumper stickers on their, their cars, you can identify as well. Yeah, I found that when your subject is driving a Dodge Dart, all in the world you see on the interstate is Dodge Darts, like 15 of them in a row. Um, so personal identifiers make a model of car. If you can get a photograph of the car, that's really helpful. Um, anything about the car that can, can differentiate it from other like models. For instance, if they have the little stickers on the back of the car that say, you know, that has mom, dad, and the kids, those kind of things, or my school is an honor student at, um, Midvale school for the gifted, uh, anything that you can use to make sure that you're on the right car is terribly useful. Um, as far as the subject goes, I've worked on a couple of cases where I got information from the client that had one picture and it was just a picture of their face straight on. 
Uh, and that's all I got. Ask for as many pictures as you can from your client. Um, I would like full body pictures, um, a picture of them playing sports, a picture of them playing golf, a picture of them at home, work attire, dressed up, whatever, as many photographs as you can get. Do you agree with that, Michael? Absolutely. You know, I've even had cases I always ask, you know, is there anything specific about them? And, you know, do they wear glasses? I mean, a couple of them had full sleeve tattoos on their arms. I mean, just certain things like that, you know, will definitely set them apart from the crowd. Have you ever had a case where you ended up following the wrong person? I had one case. I was in Texas and actually the guy had actually had a brother. We didn't get any information that they lived together. Of course, you know, it's one of those things. So then we followed him to a certain location is actually work. Then determined later it wasn't him because we had two investigators on the case. Then another one left and he's like, who is this? <laughs> So we had, then we called the client, determined which one was the right one. So that was the only time that was, you know, one of those rare occasions. I, I think one of the things that private investigators um, in general hate to admit is that we sometimes mess up. We sometimes make mistakes. It happens. Everybody has it happen. Um, <clears throat> the investigator that says, I've never been burned. Um, I find that to be a dubious claim. Maybe there's a guy out there that's never been burned on a surveillance job, but it happens and it's not the end of the world. And there are ways you can deal with that. But the most important takeaway from this first segment, this first topic we're talking about is um, what information do you need about the subject to get started? And I think at the end of the day, um, you know, spelling of the person's name, social security number, date of birth, um, vehicle description, uh, tag and title. Um, Brian just chimed in um, and said, client sometimes gives us incorrect information. That's absolutely correct. I get that all the time. I get information from client. They say, this guy does this. He drives this. He goes here. He goes there. They're wrong about all of it. Um, I find for me personally, and I'm going to plug TLO one more time, and whatever database you use is totally fine. If it works for you, that's great. Um, but I find it very useful to take the time to research the subject of the investigation, um, not only social media and the stuff that's readily available, go on TLO, or uh, I think it's called Delve Point now, what used to be IRB, go onto those databases and search the subject. Find out if they have a criminal history. Find out if they have a criminal history for violence. Find out if they have a conceal and carry permit. These are not unimportant things to know. Um, you want to be fully aware of the person you're following, what they're capable of. Um, and that's another way to do it. The other reason I use TLO and, uh, and delve point and sometimes clear to look up the subject is to make sure that I have the right information. Uh, sometimes you'll go into TLO with the information the client's given you. And you'll find that, you know, the 28 year old you're supposed to be following shares a name with a 65 year old. Um, and they've given you the wrong information. So verify up front. Uh, the important factors. Michael, let's talk a little bit now about surveillance vehicle. What, what kind of car do you like to use for surveillance? I think a lot of the, a lot of folks in the class day are going to be kind of curious about this. I personally use most of the time. I have a couple, but most of the time I personally use a uh, Toyota RAV4, a small SUV. It's kind of compact, roomy. The seats fold down the back, have the windows tinted all the way around. A lot of room to move and have all your, your PI gear. And again, it's one of those cars, it, there's a, a million of them around. Any other thoughts on surveillance vehicles? Ultimately, you can pretty much use anything. Just one thing I'd probably state starting off with being a, for a new investigator is get something that's going to blend in. Uh, no extravagant colors. Use like a black or dark green or a dark navy blue something that's going to kind of just blend into the environment if you're sitting in a neighborhood. It's not going to stand out like a yellow or white or a lime green. I think one of the things that bugs me the most about this industry is um, you've got a lot of people that um, want to play the role of law enforcement when they may actually not be law enforcement. <laughs> I've seen a number of investigators show up for surveillance jobs 
in a late model Crown Victoria with about 16 antennas on the back of the car. And uh, the spotlight just by the uh, uh, driver's side uh, mirror. <clears throat> Guys, if you're doing surveillance, this car screams, I'm doing surveillance. <laughs> you don't want that out there. Um, I use a Ford C-Max for surveillance. A Ford C-Max is about the most nondescript car on the road. Uh, most people have never even heard of it, but it looks like a Toyota Prius on steroids. It's a hybrid, gets great gas mileage. It will not go fast in a hurry. It doesn't have good pickup. Um, but it's a useful car because you can sit in pretty much any suburban setting and not get burned. Um, so give some thought to the car you're going to use, the vehicle you're going to use for surveillance. Um, Another thing, Michael, I'm going to ask you about this. Have you ever had a, a, a situation where you had to change cars in the middle of surveillance? We've had that when we were sitting in the neighborhood, and uh, it was just kind of a tight neighborhood, really no street parking, one way in, one way out. Uh, set for a while. Some of the neighbors were suspicious, and we don't know if they would talk to our subject or not. The neighborhood seems kind of pretty close-knit. Maybe they even have like a neighborhood watch or a Facebook page. So I broke off, went and got another car and came back, but not in the neighborhood. Again, we determined which was the best way they would travel out of the neighborhood and set up along that route of departure. Actually set up at a small church on the way out of town. Do you find that finding a church or a business or some place where there are other vehicles parked, other cars parked, do you find that to be a useful place to set up surveillance? That is one of the most best places of surveillance because you're going to blend in. You don't stand out. How do you feel about approaching um, people's homes and, and asking permission to sit on someone's property? I've done that multiple times. Um, again, you don't want some places further down in the neighborhood, but you can still have a view of your subject's house, like even where the driveway, so you can see when they physically leave the house and, and initiate mobile surveillance. We've done that multiple times, and most of the time people are open to it. Uh, of course, we don't tell them what kind of case we're working. I'll, you know, if we're working like a domestic case or insurance fraud, I'll say, uh, we're waiting to serve papers on somebody. Or we're bail bondsmen waiting to see if uh, this person comes out of this house so we can grab them. Okay. Um, I had a, the last surveillance job I did, and, and, and I don't do a lot of surveillance work anymore. I used to do more than I do now. Um, but the last surveillance job I did uh, was a child custody case and the mother was dropping the child off at school across the street from the school, directly across the street from the school, there was a berm and behind the berm was a little subdivision. And I went to the, one of the neighbor's homes, knocked on the door, introduced myself, told him who I was, what I was doing. I even told him kind of the case I was working on, um, just to give them a full idea of what we're doing. And they were totally fine with me leaving my car parked in the driveway, walking over to the berm, uh, setting up there and, and documenting the mother coming by, dropping the kid off and picking her up. I found that that job, I could document them picking the kid up, which we knew they were doing. Uh, the question was, were they going a certain direction after that? And um, I found a tractor supply company at the next intersection and went in again, introduced myself, said, hi, I'm Hal Humphreys. I'm a private investigator. This is going to sound like a strange request, but <laughs> I'm working on a surveillance job. Would you mind if I park my car in your parking lot? And nine times out of 10 people are like that's totally fine. And then they'll sit there and look out the window at you, which is totally fine too. Um, and we've got another question coming in. Someone asked about nighttime optics. We'll get to that in a minute. I, I'm <clears> sure Michael has some good suggestions on that. Uh, and we'll get to gear. Uh, it'll be not the next topic, but the topic after next. Michael, let's talk about pre-surveillance investigation real quick before you actually go out into the field. You've decided what car you're going to use. You know how to approach people in the neighborhood to, to get permission to park there. Um, but before you actually leave the office to go conduct surveillance, what are the things you do before you leave the office? I almost religiously, every time, uh, look at my addresses on Google Maps. Uh, so I have laid out of the land, uh, again, what commercial properties are around, what the neighborhood looks like, and always go to the satellite view. As you can see, if there's tree lines or kind of, again, the whole layout, you get the best, best options available for 
you can, in some of the uh, Google Maps, you can see if there is street parking before you can get out there. If that's going to be an option, we can set a couple houses down and blend in that way. Or again, if we have to sit along the route of departure, like a couple blocks down, we can just see their driveway. Okay. Have you ever had a situation where you looked on Google Maps, you think, oh my gosh, this is the perfect location. You get out there and something has changed? <laughs> Inevitably, yes. Uh, we've had an area where actually some houses were torn down and some were rebuilding. Um, there were now trees where there once were and vice versa. So yeah, it's, again, I re highly recommend and what we do is if it's feasible and in your time frame to do a uh, pre-surveillance check, do a drive-by and to actually get the physical lay of the land and you can see if there's what actual cars are there or if there's any activities. And one good thing with that is if you're like working a worker's comp case, you can check, you see the grass. If the grass is high, your person or your subject or your claimant may be uh, likely to mow the yard within the next day or two. Or if there's toys out in the yard, you know they got kids, they may be out playing with kids later. Just I mean, be aware of your surroundings and kind of re read your situation. Yeah, and I think um, do if you if you have the budget and you have the time, and even if you don't have the budget but you have the time, I find it useful to go out ahead of time, kind of drive the neighborhood, see what it looks like, see what it feels like. Sometimes you know Google Earth doesn't really give you a feel of the land. Spend some time driving around the neighborhood, seeing where people hang out. If it's an urban neighborhood, see where people gather on the corners, those kind of things. If it's suburban, see what time people walk their dogs, um, those kind of things. I think a pre-surveillance run is a very useful thing to do um, in preparing for surveillance. Um, I do the same thing you do. I go into Google Maps. I make a map set. I actually print out hard copies of the maps. Um, I know everybody's car has a GPS uh, navigation system in it now. I cannot express to you how many times I've been out in a rural setting and there's no signal and you can't follow those maps. A paper map cuts out any issues with navigation. The batteries don't go out on paper. <laughs> um, so I print out paper maps to carry with me. Uh, if I'm in an unfamiliar neighborhood or an unfamiliar area, I'll actually get a hard paper map to carry with me. Um, I find those useful. Um, so those are some things to think about before you go out into the field. And then finally, in preparing for surveillance, let's talk about equipment and we'll get to this next question of nighttime optics. Um, so if you're doing surveillance during the daytime, uh, Gear wise, you can use one set of gear. If you're doing surveillance at night, it can be kind of tricky. So Michael, kind of talk to us a little bit. And I think you may have brought some toys with you to show us. Uh, talk to us about your kit. What do you carry on surveillance? Just a couple of things. I always have a go bag or a camera bag that has video camera, a digital still camera. In that I have multiple backup batteries. Um, I have a digital voice recorder. Um, Cause when you get mobile, start following somebody, you turn it on the streets, stop at a certain location. You're not going to remember addresses or street names. I just turn on the just a digital voice recorder and just let it start running, start talking to myself, start talking out loud. So you don't miss any addresses or any times. Um, one of my biggest things, in all my cases, and all my investigators, we videotape everything. And with that, because we can pull digital still pictures from our videos and enhance those pictures and put them in our full reports. And my weapon of choice is I use a uh, Sony FDR AX33. It's like a 20 megapixel camera. This thing will zoom three quarters of a mile. It has night vision on it, but we're gonna talk about um, nighttime stuff too. Rarely ever use the night vision because it's not much clarity. Uh, with these cameras, and if you get a camera, you want something you can adjust the shutter speed. Because in during the night, you can adjust shutter speed lower, which kind of makes night into day. It's pretty awesome. But with that too, one thing noted when you're taking your video and moving your camera, it s slows the frames down. So you need to make slow, precise movements or it'll be really jerky. Michael, do you ever carry a tripod with you to try and steady the camera in situations like that? Always in my my surveillance car, whatever I'm driving, I have a tripod and a monopod. The monopod is my go-to because I can throw it on really fast and just pop it up. You can adjust the height and everything. Uh, if, I, if I'm sitting for a while, like a worker's comp case, 
and somebody's doing yard work or something, I'll set up the tripod in the back, just have it just slowly move the camera. Okay. We've got another question in here. Um, and I want to talk about nighttime optics a little bit, but this is an important question. Um, is the date stamp embedded on your camera? Is that automatically embedded? The date time stamp is automatically embedded in your camera. But one thing I found in over the years with the new digital cameras, when you go to transfer the video, it's not on there. And so there is a, a third party app or program I use that no matter what camera you use or even your cell phone, it'll automatically put the date time stamp on those photos. Okay. And what is the name of that app? It's batch photo. So batchphoto.com. Okay. So if you go to batchphoto.com, you can download an app that when you have your um, video or photo video and photos. Yes. And it's pretty expensive, like 14, $15. It's okay. About so, a last okay. So that would answer that question. I've, I've run into the same thing. Now I, I know in most cameras and a lot of cameras, at least there's a way to turn the date and timestamp function on it. It automatically burns it into the image. Um, I know in a lot of the video cameras, like the Sony video camera that I use, I was able to burn the date and timestamp into the image uh, while it was recording. And when you transferred it over, it showed up. Um, but I have used batch photo uh, in the past when I have pictures that didn't have the date and timestamp on them uh, to, to make sure that the client knows when the photo was taken, what date. Now I will say this, um, and that's the next question just popped up. Is that legally considered an edit? Number one, we're not giving, we're not giving legal advice here. Um, we're, we're, um, we're giving opinions and suggestions. I would think if you're editing a photo in any way, including putting a date and timestamp on it, that is editing. Um, I do know that almost every camera available today will have um, XF information in it. Uh, built into the, uh, the, the, the data of the photo that will tell you can verify the date and time the photo was taken. Um, if you're using a camera where the date function is set properly, it works fine and you can go back to the original um, digital image and prove that's when you took the photograph. Um, but for, for presentation purposes, um, using batch photo is not a bad way to um, illustrate for your client the date and time you took the picture. Is it an edit? Yeah, I think technically it is. Um, is that a problem? I don't think so. I've never had a client come back to me and ask about it. Honestly, I've never in testifying in court had anyone ask that question. Um, but it is something to think about. It's not a bad thing to think about. Um, I don't know the answer to the question. Um, <clears throat> necessarily, uh, I, I do think it's an edit. Uh, but maybe it's just an annotation, uh, no different maybe than circling the subject and drawing an arrow to their face on the picture, um, just to point out something. Uh, I will say this, if you put the wrong date and time on a photograph, then that's not only an edit, but it's unethical. Am I right about that, Michael? Absolutely. But the thing with batch photo, you're not typing anything in It automatically reads when the physical date and time was taken off that video image and just puts it on the picture. So you're not typing a date or time and it, it automatically generates it from the file itself. Okay. So it, it takes the data that's embedded in the photograph yes. and automatically generates a date and time stamp off of that. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So maybe that answers your question. I think that, that, that would, um, that it, would it, kind of limit that problem. Now I have seen programs where you can key in the date and time stamp and I have used those. Um, I think there could be a problem with that. Yeah, definitely. Cause there's that opportunity. Yeah. Okay. Um, but everyone in this webinar and everyone in our industry is ethical and upstanding and would never try to mislead anyone. Am I right about that? Absolutely. Okay. Um, Okay, moving on. Uh, necessary surveillance equipment and gear. We've talked about that a little bit. I do want to spend some time um, talking about alternative equipment. I know that Michael has a go bag in his car. Um, he, he's got more gear than I know what to do with. Um, I have been a gear hound in the past. Um, I prefer personally in the last surveillance job I worked, and this was back in, I don't know, 
February and March of this year, um, I used this device for the entire job. Uh, I used the video function to document the subject coming and going to a school. I used the camera function to take pictures of the subject doing various things. I used the voice memo to talk all the notes as I was on the road, reading out um, number plates, reading out addresses, reading out directions of travel. So that when I got back to the office, my entire surveillance was on my iPhone. Um, it's a great way to do it. Now I will tell you one of the problems with that. Uh, I just had my old iPhone die. And in the process of dying, I lost a lot of information. So if you do use your iPhone for surveillance purposes, please, I beg you, please, when you get back to your office, back it up. Because the worst thing you can do is um, get really good information delivered to the client. And then six months later, they call you and say, hey, we have a court date. We need you to testify. And you don't have the information. That would be devastating. Michael? I totally agree. I would say more than not, most of the surveillances, um, even when I do speaking engagements for different places, I tell people I've had more fake phone calls on my phone than real because I'm following people into intimate places, bars, restaurants. I've even followed people into like working conventions and stuff. And I'm acting like I'm having a phone conversation. I'm taking videos and pictures or I'm sitting at a bar acting like I'm on the internet or texting and I'm getting all the evidence I need. Yeah. Um, so it's imperative to have a phone that has a good camera and know how to use it. Okay. And going back to the uh, date and timestamp business, um, Stephanie, Stephanie Mitchell, uh, our manager here at PI education. If, if the folks in the webinar are customers of PI education, I'm sure you know the name Stephanie. Uh, she keeps this machine running without her. We would be totally lost. Uh, Stephanie says um, when she does surveillance jobs, where she has uh, a photo where she has put the date and timestamp on. She gives the attorney an unedited copy, and then she gives him one with the date and timestamp and a disclaimer stating that, that she's, she's added the timestamp to the photo just for visual reference, just to let the person know when the picture was taken. So that's a good idea. So you let, and again, let the attorney know what they're dealing with. Um, several years ago, I had a case where I got some amazing video um, off of uh, a hidden camera. And this camera was made in China. It was made poorly, but it worked perfectly for the application. The only problem was I was not able to change the date and time. And it had been set to a 24 hour time period, but it was the time zone was China. So I had to adjust the date and time uh, to present to the client. And I was able to tell the client up front, I got a great camera. It'll do the job, but we've got to deal with the time stamping issue. And somebody may call that into question. Nobody ever did, but it's something to think about. Just let your client, let your attorney know everything that you're doing so that they can deal with it appropriately. Um, we've got one question on here about backyard viewing. How do you, how do you document what someone's doing in their backyard? The privacy is always a big concern in the PI world. Um, from a legal standpoint, you need to be in a public area. I mean, you can be on a, the side street or the street, uh, that parallels their house and behind it and shoot through the houses. I mean, if it can be seen from a public place, then you're okay. Um, so you're, what you're saying is your understanding is if you're in a public place and the person can be seen from said per public place, you're totally fine. Yeah. I mean, you can't go to an eight foot privacy fence and put your camera on the top of it. I mean, you're going to get, they're going to eat your lunch. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, what about, uh, you're on a street and somebody's window is open and you can see them inside the house moving around. Can you stand there on the street and videotape inside their house like that for hours on end? From the street point of view, not zoom in. I mean, if you're a, somebody walking on the sidewalk can see the same thing and have that same view. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I do have a video here that I'm going to show real quick. And this, this video has no, um, it has no, audio with it, but I'm going to take some time for us to, uh, 
play this for the folks. Um, this is Michael Sands in a restaurant using his handy dandy cell phone on a surveillance job. Michael, can you see that video? Yes, sir. Okay. Tell us what's going on here. Here uh, I followed a couple into a bar uh, meeting and had to document their activity together and that they're actually meeting and they're supposed to be at other locations separately. Okay. And this couple, just for full disclosure, that's, <laughs> that's me at the bar and one of my best friends pretending to have a date so that you can do surveillance on us. But this is a really good example of how one might conduct surveillance in a public place at a bar. Um, you can see uh, Michael has the camera in his hand and that's, that's the extent of the video we have for that. But Michael's got his camera in his hand there. Uh, his iPhone in his hand, and he's he's able to document this couple as they you know sit there and and canoodle and whatnot um, on their date. So again, using using the iPhone is a really handy tool um, to uh, get get uh, good documentation. I'm going to play one more video while we're here. Um, let's see if I can get this one to play. Let's open this up, application view and share. All right, so this is a situation where we have um, three investigators following one person who is uh, on the way to meet his girlfriend at a local shopping center. Uh, you can see investigator one and two, and you can see the subject there. The subject is crossing the street. Investigator one walks on straight there. Investigator two is a guy in the blue jacket. He turns in front of the subject. Here's our nefarious actor right there on the way to meet his girlfriend at a shop this is investigator one he's now uh, gonna sneak back across the road and drop in behind investigator two walks out there's the subject and his girlfriend giving a hug you see michael there let's back that up for a second i want to show this because this is this is pretty good stuff <laughs> so you got michael sands right there he's investigator one he has uh dropped out the front and he's now following so the blue sweatshirt we see right there is uh, investigator two. He has jumped in front of the subject uh, and is walking in front of them. So let's see what we got here. So we have our subject, the guy in the hat and his girlfriend. And again, for full disclosure, the subject is my father-in-law <laughs> and the girlfriend is one of Michael's other investigators. So uh, these are actors, but it's a good example of how to do surveillance. So these two are meeting at a store. And you can see as they hug, right there is Michael Sands talking on his phone. Behind him is a FedEx guy. So this is right out in the open, in plain view of everybody. And he's getting amazing video on his cell phone. So that's the video. That's the actual video from his cell phone. And this is pretty good. And notice the store that the, uh, the loving couple is going into there. It's Victoria's Secret. Uh, there's no other reason to go in there than, um, well, you know. And again, look at this video. This is off of a cell phone. Um, and this is a great example of how you can use a cell phone to document what your subject is doing and not get caught. Okay. Um, so we'll stop sharing the video now. Any, um, any questions about how to, uh, how to address, um, mobile surveillance like that and what, what gear one might use in that setting. Something like to add, Hal. Um, one thing I have added to my arsenal over the last couple of years, you can get, gosh, even a Coles or Marshalls, different places. I have a, uh, uh, like a telephoto lens. You can turn any cell phone into a, a spy phone. So if you're following somebody into a park or you're, you can't get close or intimate and get those close shots. You can still be far away and zoom in on them and get okay. clear evidence. That's pretty handy. we got a question here. Um, someone says, I've used an RC car with an onboard camera, <laughs> drove it into a bush next to the street sidewalk and got the video. Thoughts on that? Again, this industry, kudos. As creative you as you can be is, is even better. That's my motto and what I look for when I hire an investigator, you know, how, how creative you can be. And, uh, that, that's pretty good. Yeah. I like the idea of an RC card. The 
problem I see with it is you might get into a spot where you might not be able to go. So you'd have to be careful. I think if you're, if you're on a public right of way like that, I don't see you have any, 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 um, any problems with that. Now let's talk a little bit. We noticed if you notice that video we just showed, there was a, an overhead shot of the investigators walking on the street and that was done. I happen to know this because I was there, but that was done using, um, a drone, uh, a quadcopter. So talk to me a little bit, Michael, about, um, the issues of using a drone for surveillance. Have you ever used a drone and, and what are the things that you're concerned with as a drone operator? Uh, one thing before you use it, can use a drone on any case, uh, you have to be licensed commercially by the FAA. Um, anybody can buy them and use them for recreational use, but to be able to use them in any capacity to get paid for, you have to be commercially licensed. And that's my background. I'm actually got a commercial instrument multi-engine airplane pilot. Again, flew helicopters in the Army. I got certified by the FAA and my drone's licensed by the FAA to use. And again, public airway, I mean, if a plane can see it, I mean, you can't be down intimate, you know, 10 feet over them. Um, some of the video I've got um, on a case um, was, you know, three or 400 feet in the air, and you can still get good quality video or pictures. But with that, you can edit it later and zoom in on it. Okay, okay. Um, I know that there may be some uh, expectation of privacy issues to deal with. Uh, I am not suggesting that you use a drone. I think there might be cases where a drone could be useful. Um, but you know, if, you, if you've got a drone, if you're comfortable with it, if you use it, consider it, think about it. I would talk to your attorney and see what they have to say about it. Um, along the lines of equipment, we're gonna use, and we just got another question came in and I want to get to this. Uh, we'll get to this a little bit later on. Uh, but the question deals with, um, climate and how to deal with, uh, real world surveillance issues. Um, but before we do that, let's talk about GPS trackers. And, and I've, I've gone on record a number of times speaking against using GPS trackers. Um, Michael, tell me your thoughts on GPS trackers. With those, I personally don't use them. I actually have two trackers, but I will lease them to a client and give them you know, the legalities of it, that they can use it on their own vehicle. And with that, then give us the information they um, obtain from that. So if they, for an infidelity case, if a wife puts it on her husband's or on her car, lets him borrow it for a couple of days, um, she can tell us what house he's going to, what address, or what bar he's going to for a certain amount of time. And we can adjust our tactics off of that. Okay, so what you're, what I'm getting from that is, you don't use the GPS for real time tracking of a person. You use it to kind of establish patterns and see where they're going, what their habits are. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Um, my thoughts on using a GPS tracker, uh, and, and that's a scenario I don't necessarily have a problem with. Um, but my thoughts on using a GPS tracker, um, if I'm the PI and I own the thing, and I provide it to the client and they use it, it can come back to me. Um, so I want to be very, very careful about that. Number one, number two, in Tennessee, if you track a car that is not yours and you get caught, I believe it's a felony. If not a felony, it's definitely, um, one of the higher grade misdemeanors. It's not nothing. And it could, uh, if you get busted using a GPS tracker on someone else's car, uh, you could get in some pretty serious trouble. Um, I find that actually doing surveillance and being on the ground and watching the person where they go is the most useful thing. I have worked on cases with other investigators uh, where they used a GPS tracker. And this is, Michael, you'll get a kick out of this. This was a, 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 an investigator out in Texas and he hired five or six of us to work on this job because he had to get the goods. And he had a GPS tracker on, on the lady's car and comically, 40 minutes after the surveillance started, what happened was we had the subject's car going down a rural road in the middle of backwater Texas with six other cars following behind her in a line. Um, and this was in the middle of nowhere. It was like totally obvious that something funky was going on. So if you're gonna use GPS trackers, again, talk to your attorney, see what they have to say about it know that you're the one doing the work. You're the one putting the, the tracker on the car. Therefore you're the one that's going to be held responsible 
if you've done the wrong thing. So know the legalities of GPS tracking. I know that um, some people are dead set on the uh, the usefulness of a GPS tracker. It's not something that I'm comfortable doing, but I know some people are. I just urge you to talk to your attorney and find out what the what the best practices are for that. Um, Michael, any other considerations on gear? Mm. Again, all the gear you have, if it's battery operated, have extra batteries and make sure everything is charged. Um, one thing I can't say enough too, I mean, about your surveillance car or truck or your vehicle is prior to going surveillance, make sure it's filled up with gas. <laughs> uh, again, in this industry, you learn from your mistakes. And believe it or not, I mean, when I first started, I, mean, I had to go on a surveillance for a couple of days and just went out to the my car and jumped in it and went on a case. Then I had to had to follow somebody. Luckily, they stopped someplace I could go across the street and get gas. But yeah, make sure your car is filled up. Okay, that's fantastic advice. Um, let's talk about in the field. You're actually out in the field doing surveillance. We've talked about some scenarios, but um, I want to talk about some of the things that we run into in the field. Um, I saw this question posted. Um, they said hot conditions. What are people using to cool down when you can't run your AC all day long? Uh, I want to talk really quickly. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I do want to talk really quickly about summertime in Tennessee is painfully hot and humid. Likewise, wintertime in Tennessee is painfully cold and humid. So what are some things that you do, Michael, to deal with the extreme heat and the extreme cold? I, I, and before you answer, like a day like today, you can sit in a car all day long and be fine. But I've done surveillance uh, here in middle Tennessee in the middle of the summer and thought I was going to die. So what do you do to combat the hot? I always have an uh, actual electric fan that takes batteries so you can have some air flowing on you. Uh, another thing is the cooling towels, like the frog towels or whatever they are. I always have one of those in my car as well. They can put around your neck or anything to help cool off, wipe your arms or legs down if you have shorts on. But again, you, dress for conditions. Do you keep those towels in a cooler or something like that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, when because I, I take a little snack bag or lunch box with a couple waters in it and some snacks to you know, maintain through the day. It depends on the surveillance, but yeah, I'll keep that in the cooler with uh, several ice packs. Okay. Let me ask you this. What about wintertime surveillance when it's, when it's just painfully cold out there? And if you were to run the car, the exhaust would show. So what do you do to stay warm? What do you stay, what do you do to keep the windows from fogging up? Most of them, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. You can't, can't keep the car running because your exhaust is going to give you away wherever you're sitting at. Um, again, just layer up. Um, you may have to try to keep, always try to keep one of the windows or a couple of windows cracked, kind of main, uh, equal out the pressure so the windows don't fog up. Okay. Um, it's difficult. And I'm sure that some of the folks uh, in the class today have dealt with these issues. Um, I, you know, do the best you can in, in extreme situations. Uh, these are the reasons why I don't really enjoy doing surveillance work is I don't like to be that hot. I don't like to be that cold. I certainly don't like to be those ways for a long period of time. Um, I got another question up on the screen. Any fresh ideas on confirming whether a claimant or subject is home or not when you're on surveillance? Um, I think that's, and, and then they said, I hope that's not too off topic. That's not off topic at all. How do you tell if your claimant is home or if they're not? How do you tell where they are? One thing I've done a lot, I mean, if you've done your research, you have all the information, um, you have phone numbers. If people still have a home phone, if they have a home phone, Call it as the wrong number. Ask for somebody else or ask for that person and you just come up with a random pretext. Uh, you're from the school and want to verify something or you're from uh, from somewhere else. You just got to be creative, again, creative as you can be, but just see if you can get them to answer the phone to verify they're there. Or if somebody picks it up, ask for that person. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that gets into one of the topics we wanted to talk about today is the idea of pretexting. And this is, this is one of the cases where I think pretexting can be useful. Um, I have called a number, uh, you can use a Google number or some kind of a burner phone or something, but call someone's number, ask to speak to them, start talking to them about something completely off topic. They're going to say, who are you looking for? And you're like, Oh, is this not Bill Stevens or whatever? And then say, Oh, I'm so sorry. Wrong number. Um, 
there are issues about approaching um, claimants and witnesses. Uh, if they're represented by an attorney, you've got to be very, very careful about talking to them. Uh, pretexting is a fine way to tell if someone is at home. Um, again, I'm going to say talk to your attorney and find out what their thoughts on the thing are. Um, find out what they are comfortable with you doing. Uh, and that question was from Matthew. And Matthew, out of all, I would also say, you know, if, if you're out at night um, doing surveillance at night, you can usually tell by the lights going on and off. That's a pretty easy tell. Um, during the daytime, uh, just check what cars are there. Um, if you see a car there in the morning and it's gone in the afternoon and then another one's there in the afternoon and the other one comes back and just, just pay attention to those details and those kind of things will help you, uh, tell whether or not the person is home. I worked on a, a criminal defense case here in Tennessee years ago where I was trying to look at a witness and I went by the house on Thursday afternoon and there was a, I don't know, a, a, a Dodge, uh, caravan in the driveway. And I went and knocked on the door nobody came to the door. Nobody was home. I couldn't hear anybody walking in there. So the next morning I drove by the same Dodge caravan is there, hasn't moved. Nothing's changed. I just made the assumption they're not there. But later on that morning, there was a Jeep Cherokee in the driveway. Uh, the Dodge caravan was still parked in the same spot. So I took the opportunity to go up and approach the door and see if the witness was there. And sure enough, there was someone home. Um, so just pay attention to little details like that. Uh, and if anybody out there listening wants to chime into the chat and, and give suggestions on how to tell when a claimant is home, some creative ideas for that, please feel free to. Um, I want to move on to a couple of topics that I think are pretty important um, and don't get discussed just a whole lot. One is what to do when you're approach, approached by the police. Michael, what do you do when the police come up to your car and say, what are you doing here? Well, first of all, most of the times, depending on the area I'm in, I will call the local police department, sheriff department, the non-emergency number, and just tell them I'm in the area. Give my vehicle description. Most of the time, they want a plate number, and they'll want your cell phone number. So if they get any calls or complaints, but doing that, being proactive like that, because I've had it where somebody will call in a suspicious vehicle, and the police will say, "It's okay, we know they're there. They're fine." So I definitely always try to call in to local law enforcement you're at. But if you are approached, just you know, to be honest with them, hey, I'm a private investigator. I'm working a case in the area. I'm probably going to be here for another couple hours. Just kind of be upfront yeah. with them. Just be honest with them. Um, and I find that, you know, the, the couple of times I've been approached by law enforcement when I'm on surveillance, um, hands at 10 and 2 compliant <laughs> uh, with your license in your left hand, uh, identifying you, not just your driver's license, but your PI license as well. Just, you know, tended to compliant to let them know, Hey, I'm not a threat. Uh, I find that most police officers really appreciate that gesture. Uh, it lets them know that you know how they work. Um, and be honest with them, tell them, Hey, I'm a PI. I'm working a case. Can't tell you any of the details, but if you need me to move, I will, I would prefer to stay here. They'll usually work with you. The, um, I've found law enforcement to be uh, pretty easy to deal with. Let me ask you this, uh, Michael, have you ever had a, a situation where you were confronted by um, either the subject of an, of an investigation or someone else? And I ask this because I saw last week on Facebook, a video of an investigator sitting in a car and a neighbor comes out with a baton in his hand and starts yelling at him. And he actually shatters the guy's window. Have, have you ever, what do you, what would you do in that situation? Have you ever dealt with it? And what would you do? I haven't had to deal with that. I've actually had a, a mate, neighbor come up to ask what I was doing in the neighborhood. And I just had a, just had a pretext. Um, you know, I'm new to the area. I'm looking for houses in this area. And I was going to see what the neighborhood was like. And actually, I was going to say, you know, I, had, I would say, I was going to come up to your house, another house, and see what the neighborhood's like, what's the crime rate like. I mean, just, you got to kind of think on the fly a lot of times. But always try to have some type of pretext set up of what a ruse or what you're doing. I don't have a video, huh? Audio. There we go. I had an investigator one time that, that, that explained to me that he was armed and if he was confronted, he was ready to deal with it. Um, I would strongly suggest, and I know that a lot of uh, private investigators uh, are comfortable carrying weapons. They are licensed and certified to carry handguns and weapons. Um, if you're approached by someone on the street, you're in a car. 
drive away. Don't make it more difficult than it has to be. Uh, Michael, I'm going to take uh, the, the next couple of minutes and just kind of get us to a wrapped up point. Um, okay. We've covered some good topics. I think we've answered pretty much all of the questions that have been asked. Um, Michael, one time before we get off the off the hook here, I'm going to switch back over to you. Tell us, um, tell us, you know, the name of your company, how to get in touch with you if someone has questions. Um, if you're comfortable sharing your email address, that would be nice. If you're not, that's okay. Um, anything you can tell us about you and your detective agency so that these folks can kind of go check you out, I'd, I'd be thrilled with that. Absolutely, Hal. But one thing I want to add, too, about uh, checking if your subject claimant's home, notice in the mornings, check the window blinds, too. If they're closed and if they're open later or pulled, just another thing, or the uh, – outside dusted on lights, the porch light if they're on or off. But again, uh, Michael Sands, my company is Guardian Detective Agency. And uh, my catchphrase is when the truth needs proof, because no matter what kind of case we do, that's what we do, we just provide the facts. And uh, so my website is truthneedsproof.com. And if anybody wants to reach out and uh, share ideas or you know, just communicate, uh, my email is michael at truthneedsproof.com. Okay. And what we'll do is we're, um, for those of you in the class today, we're going to be, we have a recording of this webinar. We're going to share that with you. Um, and then I, I think if not at the tail of the video, at least in the email that we use to send the video to you, uh, we'll provide Michael's contact information and mine as well. Um, I do want to take just a couple minutes to, uh, to say thank you to TLO XP. Not that they actually paid any money for this uh, webinar today, but I love their product. I think they do good work. I think they provide really good information. And for those of you who are out there that use TLO, I'm going to guess that you have in the past two or three weeks gotten a call from their compliance department saying, hey, we need to redo the inspection. Uh, I just dealt with that yesterday and today. Um, and my understanding is the reason they're having to reinspect offices and verify the safety procedures is they've got some really good new information coming out, um, that we're going to have access to. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, so TLO XP, thank you guys for what you do. Uh, the other thing I want to do before we get off the line here is, uh, give you a little heads up. These webinars are going to be once a month. Uh, Pursuit Magazine and PI Education are going to host a once a month webinar. It'll be the fourth Thursday of every month. Uh, next month, it's going to be on the 28th. Um, and we're pretty excited to be joined by Brian Willingham of Diligentia Group. Uh, Brian is a good friend, fellow investigator, uh, one of the best in the country at due diligence. So we're going to be talking about... Um, Due diligence work, uh, open source intelligence, how to find information about people uh, that's out there in the open. That's this readily available, but a lot of people don't know how to go find it. So uh, next month, the 28th, join us for um, surveillance or for private investigator tactics and tricks. And um, we look forward to it. Thank you all for joining us today. Michael, thank you for being here. Thanks for the opportunity, Hal. Yeah, we're, we're excited about it. And uh, everybody in the class, again, thanks so much for being here. Uh, we hope you guys have a great afternoon and a great weekend.